that's no normal BMW. This 7 Series model flies the Alpina flag. This vehicle manufacturer from southern Germany is one of the most exclusive automotive brands in the world. Much of the tremendous power boost is already achieved at the BMW plants, and the final assembly ultimately occurs at the factory in the Allgäu, a power symbiosis where the two horsepower blacksmiths both benefit. BMW and Alpina, it's a relationship that's already 55 years old. Established in the 1960s, the family business still builds luxury cars in small series to this day. Bavarian luxury cars with the driving dynamics of super sports cars. Distinctive aerodynamics packages, high performance engines, powerful brake systems. 100 modified parts make series production models into exclusive racing machines. Many of Alpina's innovative developments were born on the racetrack and first road tested by motorsport legends. It wasn't long before we agreed that I'd drive for him. I didn't get paid much, let's just put it that way. Under Alpina's leadership, we won great races at Spa, Nürburgring. When an Alpina M3 E30 DTM with more than 300 horsepower flies over the asphalt like that, one person isn't far away. The ex-race driver, Andy Bovenziepen. He knows the touring car from 1988 like the back of his hand. No ABS, no power steering, no brake booster, but the first of its kind with a metal catalytic converter. Beautiful analog instruments. 70 degree water temperature and five bar oil pressure, 90 degree engine oil, oil pressure, five bar. When Andy isn't burning up the asphalt, he is Andreas Bovensieben. Together with his father, Burkhardt, and brother Florian, he manages the luxury race car maker. He works at the headquarters of the world renowned brand in Buchlur, Bavaria. Here, some 300 employees take BMW's best series production vehicles to the next level. After more than 55 years of building cars at this 25,000 square meter facility, it's starting to run out of room. What you see here is a typical medium-sized company. Every so often a new building was added or an old building was torn down, and then a taller one was built in its place. And it just kept growing like that. Even if many car fans think of the company with the carburetor and crankshaft in its emblem as a luxury tuner, Alpina is actually a genuine automobile manufacturer. Starting from the most powerful BMWs, the Buchloa-based team create their own models. Alpina has been officially registered as a manufacturer at the German Federal Motor Vehicle Agency since 1983. The current flagship is the B7, a luxury touring car with the power of a sports car, as heavy as a tank and as fast as a Porsche. The heart of the B7 is a twin-turbo V8 engine with a 4.4-liter displacement and 608 horsepower. With 800 newton meters of torque, the five-meter-long and more than two-ton vehicle accelerates from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 3.6 seconds. This luxury touring car tops out at a breakneck speed of 330 kilometers per hour. A buyer has to shell out between 150,000 and 200,000 euros for the luxury Alpina. Munich. Here in the main BMW plant is where the B7 is born. In the body, there's no discernible difference yet from its brother, the series production BMW. It's on the assembly line that the modification starts. Here, the assemblers mount the parts specially developed by Alpina. Engine, cooling package, suspension, wheels, brake system. About 100 components you won't find on the series production model. One out of every thousand cars built here is an Alpina. 
After that, the vehicles go to the Alpina factory. Trucks bring them 170 kilometers to Buchloe. All the add-on features that cannot be installed in the precisely synchronized workflow of the BMW assembly line are carried out and completed here, often by hand. Before the installation continues, each car first gets a new chassis number in the workshop. Every Alpina except for the cars for the US market gets its own chassis number from us. So the BMW chassis number gets crossed out and our number is added in its place. The Alpina modifications made to the BMW series production car are so radical that the result is practically a whole new automobile. And that's the reason for the luxury car's new number. The last three numbers here always stand for the current sequential model. It's the piece number. This one is basically the 657th car. The new number is then also added to the vehicle's documentation. Now, the workshop crew starts the conversion to a B7 touring car. Most of the components developed by Alpina, such as the engine, the radiator, the suspension, the wheels, and the brake system, have already been installed in the car on the BMW assembly line. What remains are the front and rear spoilers, the air ducts, the lettering, and the customized interior. The first work site here is the front apron. The new spoiler is already waiting in line. Later on, this component will supply additional fresh air to the transmission oil cooler. Then we're to the point where the spoiler can be glued in place. One colleague applies assembly adhesive along the edge of the spoiler lip by hand. Two assemblers fit the company's own aerodynamic part into position. They use adhesive tape to attach the new spoiler lip to the front. Now, the special adhesive must cure for several hours, after which the series production bumper and the new spoiler are permanently bonded together. The new air ducts bundle the airstream in a way that keeps the luxury liner's radiator and brakes from overheating. It took the men a full hour to complete the facelift. A complex work step, like mounting the front lip, is too complicated to integrate into the series production workflow at the factory. In terms of handling, the Alpina front spoiler would be too complex for the workflow at the factory. It would take too long. But at our facilities, it's really a relatively easy procedure to add the part on at the end. Stefan Maschreiter is vehicle project development manager and therefore the link between Alpina in Buchloe and the BMW plants in Germany and America. He has a continuous overview of more than a hundred components and makes sure everything is always at the right place at the right time. The plants have very complex systems that must be carefully managed. Who brings the part to the assembly line? How is it installed there? How is it fastened in place? Which inspections must be performed? What are the logistics? Which label must be applied to the component in order to get it to the right place on the assembly line at the right time? Even the smallest change, as with this light strip, can cause expensive chain reactions. Special non-standard lettering has been added to the inner face of the lens. At first it looks easy, but from a manufacturing perspective it's very complex. Because this is a lamp holder that must be pressed in and then welded to this component. The glue might diffuse and soil the lens. There are numerous inspections. And it's a lot of effort for such small lettering. Alpina is also the supplier for its own parts, which will then be installed at the German or American BMW plant. A logistical challenge. Even one small missing screw might bring a 100-meter-long assembly line to a halt. You get a sense of this responsibility when you enter the fabrication hall in Buchloe. 
A huge quantity of sub-assemblies and individual parts are stored here in this 1,200 square meter facility. To avoid delays on the BMW assembly line, in some cases, the employees in Buchlur build complete assemblies in advance. Here is the imposing B7 radiator package. This part is several times larger than the series production module, and that's why it's also delivered to the assembly line in its own rack. At first glance, this container looks just like a BMW rack, but you can already see that it has Alpina marked on it. The reason is that our cooling packages have a somewhat larger sweep. Here you see a prefabricated radiator. It doesn't fit in the normal rack, and that's why this component here was specifically modified for us so we can fabricate our parts here. And how long will this stock last? Here we have about one month of production. Everything together would be one month of production, yeah. These two employees are packaging car sets for the USA. All the components for a complete Alpina modification go into the crates. Unlike Germany, a few vehicles for the US market undergo final assembly directly in the American BMW plant. There are owner's manuals here, extra components, also emblems for the floor mats, which still have to be applied, radiator, air ducts. Then there's also the underbody panels that we also install. What you don't see here are also our aerodynamic components for the rear and the front. Right down to the key fob and the Alpina lettering, everything here is pre-assembled, perfectly packaged, and inspected for quality with data matrix code so that it can be properly scanned in and confirmed that the car also corresponds to the condition that it should. Every month, 50 such car sets leave the fabrication hall and go overseas in shipping containers. The highly secured development center has been well hidden at the back of the company grounds since 2006. The gangway connects five engine test stands and one all-wheel drive exhaust roller dynamometer test bench. In order to be registered in a country, each car must pass a very precise pollution test. An XB7 has been acclimating in the conditioning hall for 24 hours. Its components are all at the same temperature now. A technician prepares the SUV for a cold start on the roller. According to law, the engine is not permitted to run before the test. That's why the 2.6-ton race car is delivered to the windowless hull on an electric forklift. The hermetically sealed test stand chamber is climate controlled. That means all cars tested here can even provide the documentation required to register in a desert nation, right in the middle of Germany. To keep it from flying off the roller, the technician anchors this SUV to a sled. In a moment, it will reach speeds of up to 120 kilometers per hour. Standing still, that is, but nothing can be left to chance. An extraction system connects the exhaust pipes to the measurement station. The discharged exhaust gas is collected, filtered, and analyzed. Just now, the person in charge of the exhaust test stand, Jan Toynesen, is about to put the XB7 through an RDE test. Now this is the real driving emission test. In other words, we check the emissions characteristics under simulated street conditions for the simple reason that it's extremely difficult to take reproducible measurements on the road when you're looking for any sort of anomaly. And so we transfer the so-called street cycles to the exhaust roller just to ensure reproducibility. The profile for the test is loaded. Today, it's over German roadways. The colleague behind the wheel is looking forward to taking a spin on the roller. The SUV gradually comes up to speed. The monitor in front of the windshield displays a course made up of a series of acceleration and braking maneuvers. I have to follow the red line exactly here. 
left and right, the yellow lines, those are the tolerance lines. If I cross over them, I have a driving error. And I do all this now just with the gas pedal and the brakes. I don't have to shift gears, of course, because we have an automatic transmission. Giving it gas and braking for 30 minutes. Here on the test stand, Marcus Flott has already driven all over the world. The system can run a simulation specifically tailored for each country. And if he's lucky, he'll drive the next car through Australia for an hour. While the driver tries to stay between the yellow lines, the measurement station collects data on carbon dioxide and all other volatile emissions. A half hour later, the test is over and the XB7 has come one step closer to obtaining its registration in Germany while standing still. A few meters away from the exhaust roller, Florian Zatzka puts one of the five engine test stands into operation. The schedule calls for a torturous endurance run over several days. A modified twin-turbo V8 engine has been securely anchored to the test stand. Newly developed parts have been installed in the engine, and now they have to undergo some serious stress tests. Sensors at up to 100 measurement points monitor the patient's vital signs. The most important point here is actually our brake. In fact, it can both brake the engine and also, in this case, drive it. That means we can also simulate racetrack conditions, roadway conditions, that sort of thing. Basically, everything you can imagine. The test chamber is under constant vacuum to prevent exhaust gases from leaking out. The endurance test starts. The V8 is quickly accelerated to high speeds. Between full throttle and full braking, the engine will experience a complete lifetime over the course of the next several days. The test engine operates at speeds of between 30 and 250 kilometers per hour, while the test stand brake simulates several levels of resistance. The twin turbo will be subjected to this torture for 250 hours, covering the equivalent of about 40,000 kilometers. That corresponds to 200,000 kilometers out on the road. While deafening acceleration and deceleration pervades in the test chamber, the engineers monitor the system on the screen. Among dozens of parameters concerning pressure, speed, and power, they pay particular attention to one value. With today's engines, first of all, the most important point is generally the exhaust temperature. This is actually the benchmark that you're trying to achieve in the end. It's about 950 to 980 degrees Celsius. In four to five of these grueling endurance tests per year, the Alpina engine developers test their parts prototypes and advanced developments. When they withstand the punishment, they go into series production. A few meters further along in the workshop, the engine specialists remove the V8 from the test stand. They strip it down to the last screw. Cylinder head, crankshaft, valve control system, everything comes out. Until in the end, only the naked engine block remains. The endurance runner's 40,000 kilometer trip in the test chamber has hardly left a trace. When you look closely now, you see that everything is actually perfectly visible here. The points in between are all bright. That means neither has anything suffered any abrasion here, nor have any leaks developed at that point. The men of the engine department are on the lookout for cracks, leaks, or other damage. Their main focus is on the heavily stressed cylinders. That's why there's a compression measurement now. The mechanic determines the cylinder volume in order to calculate whether the compression ratio has changed after the endurance test. To do so, he fills a graduated cylinder with benzene. The compression ratio to be measured is the ratio between the largest cylinder volume and the smallest one. The combustion chamber of the first cylinder is measured. To do so, the mechanic pours in benzene until no air is left under the cover. The graduated cylinder indicates 71 milliliters. After all eight cylinders and the cylinder head have been measured, it's clear. This engine's compression ratio has not changed. 
But what about the pistons? Have they held up well under the torture? They transmit the force of the explosion in the cylinder to the crankshaft. All eight pistons will be extracted from the crankcase. The important thing with the pistons are these running surfaces. You can see here that there are no anomalies whatsoever, in other words, no marks. The other important point is in the area between these rings where the carbon deposits have formed, an oil carbon that can cause this piston ring here to stick. When that happens, it will pretty rapidly lead to engine failure. And finally, the five-bearing crankshaft is also removed from the engine block. Not only is it the most important power transmission element in every gasoline and diesel engine, but it's also part of the Alpina logo. You can find no signs of wear whatsoever here at first. All pressures, all temperatures, all running conditions that you had here during the endurance run were actually really optimal. Meticulous engine work was always the specialty of the small series manufacturer from Bavaria. The brand name Alpina would appear only on typewriters today. Had the company's founder, Burkhard Bovensieten, born in 1936, not been so infatuated with fast cars. I was a car lover even as a young boy, and by the time I was 14, I could already drive quite well. I was stopped several times for driving without a license, and they threatened me, told me I'd never get a driver's license as long as I live. And then, of course, I got one when I turned 18. The driving instructor needed only three sessions to exercise a few of my bad habits, and then it was in the bag. It was soon clear that the young Burkhard wouldn't be taking over his father's Alpina typewriter factory. Instead, he started to beef up BMW engines in a small building nearby. We had a really small department in a shack just outside the factory. During post-war Germany's economic boom, many people wanted to drive the chic BMW 1500 and the inventive Burkhard Bovensieten was also one of them. It had a very modern engine and an engine compartment with quite a lot of room, one lonely little carburetor. So I thought to myself, there's plenty of room there to install a twin carburetor system, so each cylinder has its own carburetor. That first Alpina system with Weber twin carburetors raises the BMW 1500 from 80 to 90 horsepower and it cost a whopping 980 Deutschmarks. It makes the first Alpina and the Mercedes Chaser and Burkhard Bovensieten a young entrepreneur. Then my father went out and placed that first letter-sized sheet of paper for the Alpina carburetor system under the windshield wiper of over 100 BMW 1500 drivers and brought in the first 100 Alpina customers. A handful of mechanics in a shack have meanwhile developed into a large company that is proud of its family roots. In any case, Andreas Bovensieten didn't have to go through any major relocation. It was always interesting, right from the start, that our family also lived here and that I grew up here. Back then, the children had yet to imagine their future as vehicle manufacturers. My brother Florian was maybe eight at the time and I was 12. And then we rode laps in our motocross bikes back there in the garden. In the summer and the winter, hey, it was great fun, no doubt about it. And of course, even though it was forbidden, from time to time we drove some car or another here in the courtyard. My mother's car, for example. The grounds are spacious, so of course you can get in some early driving practice. The first attempts at driving in the parents' backyard eventually launched a racing career. From 1986 to 2002, Andy Bovensieten competed in Formula 3, the European and World Touring Car Championships, the Porsche Carrera Cup, and in the 24 Hours Nürburgring, where he was overall winner in 1988. Awesome, when the V8 engine with 575 horsepower responds to the throttle, an amazing sound. Yeah, it really delivers. 
This green mail car is a BMW Alpina B6 GT3 from 2009, built to take on the entire racing world. We had the idea to go up against Ferrari, Lamborghini, Aston Martin, and a Porsche 911. With a curb weight of 1.3 tons and a top speed of 285 kilometers per hour, Alpina took seventh place in the FIA GT3 European Championship. It has great grip on the front axle and on the gas. The car drifts a bit. Fast out of the corner, paddle shift, it changes gears within tenths of a second. And then in 2011, the team had its greatest success. In the hard-fought Adeatse GT Masters Racing Series, the sky's the limit for the bright green B6. The two pilots, Alexandros Margaritis and Dino Lunardi, won four of the 16 races that season and were named driver champions in the German GT3 Championship. Everyone gave it their best throughout the season, and then we just celebrated and savored our victory. It was really cool just to show how good we were once again. And then in 2013, the company withdrew from racing. But perhaps we'll see Alpina back on the race course someday. Today, Andreas Bovenzieten's private course for his first driving attempts has become a booming enterprise. 300 employees build some 2,000 luxury cars per year. The great strength of this Buchloe-based company has always been in the development of new parts and components. So in 2006, we decided to build a whole new development center with five test stands and an exhaust roller. In this building alone, more than 50 engineers work on the second floor. We have nearly 100 engineers just doing research and development on the new cars that we want to market in the future. On the upper floor of the development center, an idea becomes reality. Engine, suspension, and body modifications are first created on the computer. The engineer's digital plume was also the source of the striking front spoiler. Its function is to hold the super-fast Alpinas to the ground and cool their engines. Now here we have a comparison between the basic BMW on the right and our car on the left. So you can see that we add the front spoiler to the lower part of the BMW body, thereby generating additional cooling air surfaces. And here we also made a very large air intake to be able to supply enough air to the transmission oil cooler behind it. So BMW gives us the CAD data about two years before our series production launch, and that's when we start developing our body packages. Once the computer models are complete, employees in the plastic workshop produce the first physical prototypes. In the 21st century, the 3D printer has long since become their tool of choice. Then we have printed parts made. They are separate segments that we then assemble. Here are the separation lines everywhere. They're glued together. And then with a coating, that's how we can already prepare an initial representation of the vehicle and go into the wind tunnel and make some initial tests to see if everything fits. Munich. In BMW's own wind tunnel, the Alpina engineers push a B3 Touring with new body parts onto the roller. From the shape of the smoke trails, the developers determine whether the air duct and new aerodynamics of the prototype work. To fully test a new front spoiler, the team spends up to three days in the wind tunnel. And then it's back to Buchloe with the test results. The results from the wind tunnel are then incorporated into the next step. To test the spoiler out on the road, components are handmade from glass fiber reinforced plastic, or GRP for short. 
These molds create new spoiler lips every two or three days. Then the test cars go to work. Eight months after the initial idea, a new body part makes it into a street vehicle for the first time. To keep the new development a secret, the prototype parts are covered with adhesive camouflage film. The film's confusing pattern makes it impossible to identify the shape, structure, and appearance of the development part. Too bad for the competition and for the magazine reporters trying to get a beat on the latest prototypes. This test platform vehicle, that's what the specialists call the test car, is a series production BMW X7. The Alpina engineers test their new parts on it. When the prototypes pass the test, then they go into series production. Today, the team is completing the last measurement runs needed to obtain road use approval for Germany. The test driver installs his control station in the car. It consists of a reinforced laptop mounting bracket that prevents it from breaking loose and flying around, even during extreme braking maneuvers. The computer uses a network cable to collect data from dozens of sensors in the engine and transmission. This is a, this is a standard BMW modified to Alpina standards here in the workshop. Hundreds of other sensors were installed in suspension, engine, cooling system, etc. Every test vehicle is also equipped with two of these potentially life-saving buzzers. No, it's not a quiz show buzzer. It's an emergency stop button. When you're driving in the road and unintended braking or anything like that occurs, then you can use it to shut down all systems instantaneously. We have that both for the suspension regulation systems and for the engine. The driver will pay particular attention to the different temperatures in the engine and the transmission. The measurements show him how well the newly designed spoiler lip supports the SUV's cooling system. Now it's time for the camouflaged car to leave the workshop and go out on the track. But not just yet, because it needs one more thing first. A pit stop at the company's own gas pump. The XB7's 80-liter tank has to be full. An unscheduled stop at a service station would be too risky for this top-secret car. So 30,000 liters of gasoline and 20,000 liters of diesel fuel are stored underground at the company's facilities. Andreas Wippel is both a test driver and an engineer. He knows how the new spoiler lip must perform for the vehicle to obtain the release for small series production. The transmission could get stuck, in which case it no longer opens. The oil is still circulating and the transmission gets too hot and then we immediately have an error message. The new front spoiler supplies the Alpina transmission oil cooler with additional air. Because the V8's drivetrain, with its 800 newton meters of torque, generates a tremendous amount of heat. At average speeds, everything looks good so far. The transmission oil is at 36 degrees Celsius. That's still in the lower third of the range. It's usually up around 90 to 95 degrees. Now we've got an open stretch. Let's increase the driving load. Now, Andreas Wippel really steps on the gas and accelerates the XB7 to over 200 kilometers per hour. The oil temperature rises quickly to 90 degrees. You can see that the transmission temperature stays within range and there's a reasonable increase. The new front spoiler should do more than just cool. Above all, it must hold with an iron grip, even when the speedometer hits 290 kilometers per hour. Prior to series production release, a dozen test drivers punish every new Alpina part over about 200,000 kilometers of road of North America, Southern Europe, and Scandinavia. By doing so, the developers test the operation of their components in different climate zones and under all weather conditions. The spoiler held up well today. That much is clear. After the highway driving here on the road, the oil is now back to about 80 degrees Celsius, which is okay. Not too high, not too low. So it's well regulated. And now, nothing more stands in the way of obtaining road use approval for Germany. 
But then again, the new XB7 will be built in the USA. In Spartanburg, South Carolina, BMW operates its largest plant in the world. On the 460 hectare grounds, 11,000 people produce 1,500 cars a day under Bavarian management. This is also where the SUV from Buchlur sees the light of day. Its life starts out as a basic X7. But then, the special Alpina parts are installed as a fully integrated part of series production. Every 500th car from Spartanburg is then equipped as an XB7. The 1.8 meter high, 2.6 ton vehicle is driven by a twin turbo V8 with a 4.4 liter displacement. The specially equipped Alpina variant has 621 horsepower, 91 more than the standard configuration. And the torque also gets an upgrade. Instead of 750, a full 800 Newton meters accelerate this massive vehicle from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.2 seconds. The top speed remains the same at 290 kilometers per hour. The new aerodynamics package consists of front and rear spoilers. There's also a new exhaust system and the striking 20 spoke wheels. Anyone who wants the entire interior upholstered in leather then pays the top price of about 200,000 euros. The XB7 is currently the largest and heaviest representative from Buchloe. Nevertheless, this road cruiser has Alpina in its blood and the soul of a race car. From the very beginning, motorsport has played a key role for the company. As you can clearly see from this BMW Alpina 2800 CS from 1970, the owner of this jewel is Marco Kurgel. It took him a long time to get this collector's car back into shape. I discovered this car by chance in Bochum, Germany in 1999, and then rebuilt it little by little. Before starting the restoration, I first gathered up all the parts from practically all over the world. After many years of hard work, the six-cylinder is back on the asphalt in mint condition. The 1,230-kilogram coupe draws a full 300 horsepower from its engine's three-liter displacement. Tremendous output in the 1970s, and even today. Now you can see the result after many years of painstaking work. Everything has been authentically and faithfully rebuilt. The enthusiast's only templates for this full restoration were his childhood memories and a long article from Automoto und Sport that presented the car in detail in 1970. Everything is original, including this blue bucket. Well, sometimes back then, the Alpina technicians came up with that on the fly. So during endurance races, the rainwater didn't go into the trunk, but collected it in the bucket instead. Unconventional, but that's just the way things were back then. The bucket is of a new generation, of course. In those days, the CS entered races bearing a registration plate from Kaufbeuren, Germany. Back then, the cars were registered, otherwise they wouldn't have gotten past customs for Eastern Bloc races in Brunnen, Budapest. And afterwards, they were unregistered again. Marco waited 10 years for the license plate. But how much damage did the restoration do to his bank account? Well, okay, it's taken a couple of hundred thousand euros to finally get it into the condition you see here. The value is far greater now, of course, because the racing history is unique. Part of that unique history also includes Hans Joachim Stuck. The racing career of the two-time Le Mans winner began in the 1960s at the car manufacturer from Buchloe. The old photos from those days stir interesting memories. Where did Bolkot's hairpiece go? Said it fell into a sewage treatment plant. <laughs> I drove my first race 
69 Nürburgring, 300 kilometers. And then I had to get a license so I could drive in international races too. And you had to finish in the top three, three times in five races. Mountain races, circuit races, it didn't matter. And my father had contacted Mr. Bovensieben back then. Burkhardt already knew about me from my spectacular driving style. And so the two of them agreed that now I would drive these three races with Alpina. The start was then on the Auerberg with the 2002, where it ran extremely well. And that was my debut with Alpina. In 1970, Hans Joachim Stuck stirred up the racing business with his BMW Alpina 2002. The competitors saw only the rear of the Porsche killer, as the Alpina was nicknamed back then. Today, the retired race driver is all the more happy to take a little spin in a powerhouse from back then when he was still active. Here we go with the Alpina BMW 2800 CS on BMW's test track in Dingolfing. It's like coming home with the car that we drove such great races in the 70s. No power steering, no brake booster. Those were the days. Along with Hans Joachim Stuck, there were also young talents like Niki Lauda, who earned their first golden spurs in Team Alpina. When you think about how old this car is, it runs perfectly. The sound when downshifting is really fun. That sound is something irretrievable. The sound that the engine makes, that's hearing the sound of the 70s again. Colorado Orange and Matt Black in the rear view mirror more than 50 years ago, that was a bad omen for many Porsche and Mercedes race drivers. And right back into the pits. Too bad that it's already over. It's really a lot of fun to drive a great car from the old days. Sensational. For the young company in the 60s and 70s, racing became a springboard for making the Alpina brand world famous. Founder Burkhard Bovensieben definitely wanted to present his advanced development of BMW engines to a broad public. And the amazing racing circus was the perfect vehicle for it. Motorsport is the best stage to showcase how competitive you are. In those wild days, another racing legend started his career in Buchloe. Burkhardt called me. I drove to Buchloe. It wasn't long before we agreed that I'd drive for him. The pay was relatively low, at least by today's standards, but I was supposed to go and do my military service in Austria. And if I worked abroad, then that whole business would be postponed. And that's why my second question to Burkhardt was, can I register with you? That's why I was registered in Buchloe, also began to work there and started out in a great season. The racing colleagues were enthusiastic about the young Austrian. The best was the 1973 Nürburgring race, a six-hour race where Nicky drove a lap time that was never surpassed again in the Alpina with a two-valve engine. Back then, Nicky Lauda drove the 22 kilometers of the North Loop in 8.21 minutes. Average speed, 160 kilometers per hour. Actually, we didn't think we were ever particularly good, but the others were much worse. <laughs> South German modesty. And Burkhardt, that was really typical of Burkhardt. He has this idea the cars are so dirty. It had rained at the Nürburgring and then everything is just filthy. He wants both cars, and both were in the lead, to stop at the pit. The lead was big enough to wash them, so he then had his finish line photo with clean cars. And then I asked him if he was crazy. Maybe so, but most of all, Bovenzieten had a vision for the future of Alpina. 
Under Alpina's leadership, we did a really great job, no doubt about it. And we also won some great races in Spa and the Nürburgring. We worked hard at the same time, we also had fun. The secret to success was the brand name Alpina under the leadership of Burkhard Bovensieten. Back in one of the two workshops. With the front spoiler already mounted, now the B7 gets the aerodynamic component for the rear. The spoiler isn't just for looks. It pushes down the rear of the touring car, holding it to the road. Adjusted by hand, the spoiler adheres to the right place in a few seconds. Because tensioning tools or clamps would scratch the paint, these sandbags provide the necessary contact pressure. Now, the glue cures for 12 hours. While everything is drying in the rear, a colleague replaces the switch paddles on the steering wheel of the B7. He replaces the standard BMW levers with a racing development with switch buttons. The installation of the airbag is the last thing left to do. And then the leather steering wheel is complete again. Nearly all Alpina steering wheels go through the hands of Isolde Klöck. With a patient hand and an acute eye, she recovers a steering wheel in six hours. A little stitch or a little thing daneben, and the whole job was done. The series production steering wheel was removed, covered with four new pieces of leather, and stitched together. The Saddler produces 270 pieces per year, entirely by hand. And there's also always a little something extra. The Saddlery covers more than just steering wheels. For 24,000 euros, the 13 employees replace the entire BMW interior. Up to 120 vehicles per year get a new Alpina interior in Buchloe. For a car like this, it takes one finisher about 120 hours. When it's all said and done, an SUV interior has close to 40 square meters that need to be reupholstered with leather. The required cuts come from this cutting table. In Buchloe, they use Lavalina leather from southern Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. The employee uses the projector to position the template in a way that leaves the least amount of scrap. The plotter wields its shape blade to cut the outlines in the leather. 427 individual pieces are required for the interior of the XB7. These cuts here are just for the driver's seat. An automotive saddler then sews the complicated leather shapes into a seat covering, joining nearly 90 segments together like a puzzle. Fabricating a complete driver's seat gobbles up 16 hours. Then, equipped with monitor, switches and screens, it can be installed in its final position facing the instrument panel of the SUV. We stop where we meet parts equipped with an airbag that we haven't tested. The top of the dashboard, for example. Because as a car manufacturer, we would have to conduct new crash tests, and that would make the whole thing too expensive. The old leather from the standard series production interior is chopped up and recycled. Home stretch to the finish line for the 7 Series touring car. This plaque is mounted to the center console of the Buchloe cars, and then the small series luxury car is finished. Now, the 200,000 euro touring car can show what it's made of. It was fully equipped at the BMW plant in Dingolfing. Then the specialists in Buchloe completed the Alpina upgrade. For the extra 64,000 euros over the cost of the standard seven series model, the proud owner gets a reworked twin-turbo V8 engine with 608 horsepower and a modified exhaust system. The extra 50 newton meters of torque catapults this race car from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour one second faster. 
the top speed is now a full 330 kilometers per hour. The new exterior includes a front apron, 20-inch forged wheels, a rear apron with diffuser fins, and the rear spoiler. In addition, there's also an exclusive interior, appointed with the finest lavalina leather. Alpina, car manufacturer from Bavaria and one of the most exclusive automotive brands in the world. When the power of a BMW isn't quite enough, there's special equipment from Buchlohe that transforms a series production car into a truly superlative automobile. This family business will keep developing high-performance parts in the future. So horsepower junkies with some pocket money can stand out from the crowd.